Good morning. Good to see you. Well, thank you for that welcome. It's always a privilege for me to be here, uh, both uh, to listen as well as to share some thoughts. And, uh, uh, you know, I used to speak in this room, uh, and I've always enjoyed it because our voices rattle around in here, and the music is pretty dynamic. And Sam and his team did a phenomenal job today, and so it's good stuff. I, I want to read a couple of verses to you uh, today. Uh, they come out of the book of 1 John. If you have a copy of the scriptures, uh, you can turn to it. Uh, if not, uh, just listen up. There's only three of them. And uh, it says this. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God or the sons of God. And as such we are, for this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know him. And beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it has not yet appeared what we shall be, but we know that when he should appear, we'll be like him, because we'll see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself even as he is pure." Uh, really, the subject of this passage today is hope, and uh, when we look at hope, it's not really a general optimism. It's not necessarily looking at the bright side of things or seeing the best in people, and those are wonderful qualities, and we want to develop them. But sometimes uh, realism and some of the heartaches of life has a way of uh, pushing aside optimism and uh, a positive spirit. Uh, we realize that problems do occur, and suffering is real, and uh, death happens. And so while realism can squelch optimism, it cannot tamper with hope. And what, what hope is, at least Christian hope is, is the assurance of the triumph of God and the triumph of his purposes and really, we're included in that purpose, and so, uh, de facto, a triumph of us as well. Uh, I, I want to illustrate that a little bit, and, uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, all-time sporting events took place in the 1980 Olympics uh, there in Lake Placid. That was 35 years ago. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with this little bit of Heilgeschichte, or sacred history, if you please... Uh, let me bring you up to speed. Uh, those of you who are from Voyagers and have heard this story before, I want to apologize for telling it yet again. Uh, but nevertheless, in 1980, uh, you may recall back then that America was in the tank. Uh, interest rates were way up. Uh, the economy was way down. Uh, the Cold War was still with us. The Soviet Union was still very united and very powerful. Uh, and still together. And to pile on a little bit, we were a year into that Iran hostage crisis, and uh, our national leader didn't seem to know what to be able to do in order to relieve it. And there was one time where we sent in our crack troops uh, to try and rescue those hostages, but then the helicopter crashed in a sandstorm, and so things were bad. Uh, and now we were going to... Uh, entertain the world at the Lake Placid Olympic Games. And that's, those were the games where Eric Hyden won those five gold medals for speed skating. And obviously part of the venue was the hockey game. And it was during those days that were pre-professional. And that's when the United States put together a hockey team that was full of uh, just a bunch of college students. And we were going up against the genetically altered Soviet... <laughs> powerhouse, <laughs> you know, and uh, they had obliterated us uh, not too much earlier than that in a practice game. Interestingly, at the end of the, the first period, we were amazingly up, and as you well know, our, our young boys were playing with a great deal of courage and passion. Uh, I was down in the basement 
of our very modest Canadian home at the time. We were living in Ottawa and just a couple of hours north of Lake Placid and we'd been there several times. And so um, I was sitting in the basement right on the edge of our couch watching uh, our 19-inch black and white uh, just glued uh, to this little game. And uh, my stomach was in knots, my knuckles were white, uh, my, my heart was anxious, and I, I just sat there glued to the TV. As the game was winding down, we were turning back one attack after another of this powerful Soviet team. And then you remember right before the horn sounded, Al Michaels uttered those immortalized words, do you believe in miracles? Yes! You know. <laughs> And uh, the horn sounded, and man, our, uh, my basement just absolutely erupted. There was screaming and hollering and tears of joy and hugs and high fives, and I was the only one down there, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> it was, um, yeah. It was kind of a, you know, that game was such a national phenomenon that they aired it again on television that night, and I, I watched it yet again. Uh, only this time, I invited a few friends over, and I sat not on the edge of the couch, but used the whole couch, propped my feet up, I ate some snacks, we talked, we laughed a little bit, totally relaxed, and you had the same game. Same play, same sequence, same scoring, same Al Michaels, but we were totally relaxed. And why is that? We knew the victory was secure. <laughs> exactly. And that, you know, that's what biblical hope is. It's the realize, realization that somehow, uh, we don't know exactly how, but we do know that in Christ we, in fact, uh, will triumph. Uh, that's what hope is. Uh, in other words, the defeat and the disappointments of the world are not going to be the final chapter in your life and in my life. God is going to work. Uh, you know, Christianity is um, the only religion of which I'm aware, and I'm pretty familiar with most of them, of which uh, provides an intellectual basis of hope. Uh, you know, Buddhism and Hinduism, uh, which are dominant religions in places that I go annually and have gone for, you know, 25 or 30 years now, uh, have rich ideas and uh, principles for living, uh, but they have no basis for hope. They have no belief that somehow all of the wrongs of this world will eventually be righted. And that someday that uh, we will be redeemed from this world and live uh, in a state of perfection and eternal bliss. Uh, you know, Buddhism believes that somehow you enter back into that great soul like a dewdrop in the ocean. Uh, you know, a hundred years ago, uh, there was a great deal of optimism in our country, uh, believing that secularism would prevail. Um, you know, that man who evolved from the humblest of origins, so to speak, uh, would somehow be able to achieve and conquer this world. H.G. Wells uh, wrote a book called The War of the Worlds, and he said this prior to World War II. Can we doubt that our race will realize our boldest imagination of unity and peace in a world moving toward an ever-widening circle of achievement? After World War II, he wrote this. The depravity of Homo sapiens has broken my spirit. Uh, we need hope. Uh, hope is what drives us. Uh, hope is why we get up in the morning. Hope is why we go to the gym. Hope is why we pull for the clippers. <laughs> what a bad game last night. That was uh, very, very discouraging. Uh, you know, our, our passage is hope-filled. And I read three verses, and I want to share with you three little tiny points here and comment on each one of them. 
Uh, verse 1 talks about our present status as children of God. And verse 2 talks about our future glory, our future perfection. And verse 3 talks about our, our spiritual response in the meantime to both of those truths. So let me speak a little bit uh, about verse 1 when it says uh, our status is God's children, God's sons. He says, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. Now, our English words really cannot capture uh, what John is really talking about here. He's an elderly gentleman. Yeah, Jesus has long since risen from the dead, and he's uh, back in glory. It, it, it's probably 30, 50 years after that that John is writing. But he is still amazed as an old man, and he says, Look, behold, understand that, that you've been lavished by the love of God because he, in fact, has made you as a son, and as such you are. And one of the, I have a little book called The Style, you know, by William Strunk. It's called Elements of, of Style, you know, Writing Style, Speaking Style. And one of the things he says is omit needless words. In other words, if you've got something, say it, but don't add to it so much. Just get it out. Uh, what John is doing here is violating what he says, and he's giving needless words. He says, look, behold, be blown away by the fact that God has made you his son. And then he adds, as such, we are. And why the redundancy here? And the reason is, is because John can't help himself. He is just, he, he's emoting uh, in amazement by, by what he is saying. Uh, the love of God has been bestowed upon you. You are a child of the king. And he says, I, I don't want you to get over that. You know, one of the things that the Bible does is it gives us a number of different words uh, to describe the great salvation that God has given to us. Uh, for instance, um, uh, you, as a sinner, stood before God as guilty. But because what Jesus did for you, God declared you righteous. That's what we call justification. Uh, you stood as a sinner before God uh, as an enemy. Uh, but because of what Jesus did on your behalf, God made you a friend. That's reconciliation. You stood before God as a slave to sin, but because of what Jesus did for you, uh, God set you free from that sin, and that's redemption. Uh, you stood before God with a tremendous moral debt of sin, but because of what Jesus did, God canceled it. That's forgiveness. Uh, but the last one is that you stood before God as a complete stranger. But because of what Jesus did, God made you a son. Now, it's one thing to be declared righteous or set free or to have a moral debt canceled uh, or to be made a friend. But it's a totally different thing to be made a son, brought into the family, and be an heir of the Father's wealth. And of all of those things, of all of the descriptions of our salvation, all of those theological terms that fit different contexts this, to describe the work of what Christ did for us on the cross, being a son of God is the most intimate. Uh, when trials abound and when fear dots the landscape, we need a dad. And, uh, you know, with a few exceptions perhaps, all of you are dads in this room. And what does it take uh, for your son or daughter to come into your presence to really grab your attention? Maybe a notarized list of all the good things they've done this past week or two. <laughs> you know, uh, all you need uh, is for your son or daughter, be they children or adults, uh, to have a tear in their eye and come into your presence and say, Dad, I need you. And I mean, you are there. Because you're a dad. That's what dads do. You know, we don't always know how to do everything right, but if someone that we love needs us, we respond. Because we're dads. Now, you can take your readiness 
to attend to your own children and multiply it by a thousand times and it doesn't come close to the readiness of your heavenly father uh, to be there for you as his son. Our, our little readiness uh, magnified is the kind of readiness that God, uh, that God in fact has for us. You know, uh, words really are inadequate when we try to attempt to describe the zeal that our Heavenly Father has for us. You know, and we all understand the inadequacy of words when it comes to something that's spectacular. You know, uh, a few years back, uh, my wife and I were driving up uh, uh, Highway 99 going right through Central California on our way to uh, Yosemite. Uh, you know, I had never been there in my life prior to that time. Uh, I'd never been to Yosemite. And uh, my wife had been there for the very first time three weeks earlier with a couple of girlfriends. And so as we were getting closer up around Oakhurst and driving to the entrance there, she was trying to describe to me the beauty of the place. And she had this whole array of superlatives, you know, and I was listening to her. And I says, honey, I think I've got it, you know. And, you know, but when we drove through that tunnel and entered into the valley in the middle of May, about right now, you know, when the snows had melting and the falls were, were, were flowing, uh, I was just blown away. At the beauty, I'd never, you know, of all of the places I'd been in the world, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd never seen anything as beautiful as that. And I could not speak. I simply wept. And that says something for me because I'm, I'm a bit of a stoic. I've been accused of not having a personality. And I just absolutely just, you know, I just, just absolutely blown away. By the, the, by the beauty of that, you know. And, and you think about our adoption as sons. John says, behold, just be blown away by the fact that you of all people have been made a son of the most high God. Uh, so verse one speaks of our, our present status. And verse two uh, goes into our future perfection uh, on the basis of that personal status. Uh, he says, John says, beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it hasn't appeared what we will be, but we know that when he appears, we'll be like him, because we'll see him as he is. What John is doing here is offering an apostolic confession of ignorance. He says, you know, I, I'm an apostle. I walked with Jesus for those three years, and I followed him since that time, and you know, I, I don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but I know that when we die and go off of this earth and we see God, that we're going to be like him in some way. Uh, I don't know for sure what that's going to be like, but I do know we're going to be like Christ. In other words, the DNA, the spiritual DNA that was infused in your life when you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, that is going to explode in glory and you'll be like Jesus in a way in which you never could imagine. Uh, the smile of your Father will be upon you. And it's just a reminder even now as we traverse our way through this life, you know, all the bumps and bruises we encounter, all the discouragements we have, uh, there's still this watchful care, uh, just the smile of God, the braggadocia that he has over us. He, he's proud of you. He really is uh, because he's a dad and you're his son. That's just the best way we can explain what it means to have a heavenly father who adopted us into his family and uh, the inheritance that awaits us is absolutely dynamic. And again, you know, I... He's just like an earthly dad, you know, and I know about the braggadocia. I, I uh, have four sons, you know. Uh, they're all two years apart. My wife and I were desperately trying to get a daughter, and finally after the fourth son, we ran up the white flag and said, you know, this is it. And uh, it worked out well for us because uh, we love all of the women that they married. But, uh, you know, uh, they were all in youth sports and high school sports, and for 10, 15 years, I coached just about everything that bounced. 
And when I wasn't coaching, I was watching. And there's a one little particular incident, a little story here. Um, my youngest son, when he was nine years old, was um, in Little League, and he was drafted by the major leagues of the Little League. And on, he was a, a pretty good ball player and very fast, but I didn't think he belonged on the field. Of, uh, with kids that were three years older than he was. Um, but uh, he wanted to do it, and his coach felt good about it, and I says, all right. And so, uh, you know, they wasn't a very good team. Uh, they lost all but a couple of their 20 games uh, uh, during the season. But a particular game where my son was out in center field, and we were playing a, a better team, but miraculously, we were clinging to a small lead in the last inning. And uh, the other team was up, and uh, two outs. They had loaded the bases, and they had a pretty good hitter up. Didn't look good. Uh, we were looking at another, yet another defeat. And uh, this fellow hit uh, a long fly ball to left center field, and it looked like it could clear the fence. And uh, my son Aaron was running over there with all of his might, and he made this great one-handed catch right at the wall. And I mean, all, all of the parents just erupted, you know, at least on our side. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and it was a, a wonderful, marvelous victory that was there. And then you know, one of the parents from the other side, the, the parent of the guy who hit that long fly ball, said, who was that little guy out there in center that, that caught that ball? And boy, did he ever tee it up for me, <laughs> you know. And I said, that's my son, and genetics show, <laughs> you know. And uh, I got to thinking, you know, uh, that's like our Heavenly Father. He's just so proud of us. He dotes on us. Uh, I, he is so pulling for you in this game of life. You know, and most of us are in the back third, maybe the back tenth, I don't know. But God is still pull, pulling for us uh, as his son to finish well, more than anything else, just always pulling for us. Beloved, we are the children of God, and it hasn't yet appeared what we will be, but we know when he appears we're going to be like him. You know, I used to always read that in the singular, uh, I used to read that and say, you know, one of these days, you know, I'm going to be like Jesus. I, I, you know, I'm going to die. I'm going to see Jesus, and I'm going to be like him because I'm going to see him as he really is. But in reality, it doesn't say I. It says we. In other words, we're going to be like Jesus. We're going to see like him. We're going to see him be like him. We're going to see him as he really is. In other words. Uh, we're going to see each other as we were designed to be. We're not going to see each other as we see each other now. You know, one of the things that men do, and men do well, is that we're really good at impression management. You know, I can reveal to you a lot of things about myself, but the thing that I really don't want to reveal is, much, is the, the darkest side of my own character. You know, the part that God still has a lot of work to do. You know, and the pretense and whatever hypocrisy happens to be there. You know, when I show up here on Friday morning, and particularly when I stand before you, I, you know, I want you to see something of the best side of me. I don't necessarily want you to see all of the dark side of me. You know, but one of these days, it's all going to be gone. And uh, whatever pretense or hypocrisy or impression management in which we ga engage with each other, all of that will be done away. We don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. You know, there's, there's still this idea. I don't know if, if he'll accept me, if he knew this about me, uh, when in reality, God knows everything about us and he still accepts us. And eventually, you know, and so we, we accept each other, love each other, encourage each other, push each other to the, the Lord Jesus Christ, not because we, 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 we don't accept each other without it, it's because we do love each other in the midst of it all, knowing that we're in perfection because we know what God has planned for us in, in the future. And that would be our ultimate glory. In other words, our relational satisfaction is going to go way up. You know, you're a zucchini compared to what you will be. And, you know, I'll be glad when you're not, and you'll be glad when I'm not. 
And uh, that's just kind of the way life is here on earth. Even as a band of brothers, uh, there's a measure in which uh, we're still not fully known and we don't want to be fully known by each other uh, until that day of perfection. Then one other thought in verse 3, and this uh, speaks of our spiritual response to the fact that we're children, sons of the king, and ultimately destined for perfection. How do we live right now in light of those two truths? And this is what John says. In the meantime, everyone who knows this hope fixed on him purifies himself even as he is pure. In other words, the truth uh, that we know in our, in our being up here is to drop 18 inches to our heart and overhaul our lives. Uh, there's a hope that we have within us, and it's not just a hope. It's a hope that yields in action. Uh, in other words, we live in accordance with the hope that we indeed have. In other words, God's truth becomes radioactive, and it becomes that spiritual umbrella uh, that really oversees and covers all the contingencies of our lives and is lived out accordingly. You know, our change is going to be just as radical as Ebenezer Scrooge (laughs) on Christmas morning when everything had been transformed. You know, you have the same window. He's looking out the same window of the same house on the same street, the same town, but everything is different. No more bah humbug. Uh, Christianity liberates. It frees. A lot of people who are ignorant about the Christian faith, they they look at all of the rules in the Bible and they say, no, Christianity doesn't liberate it. It restricts. It curbs your freedom. It curbs what you really want to do. In reality, however, we forget that every prohibition in Scripture is a means of divine protection in order that we might avoid those things that would bind us. And so Christianity... Uh, doesn't restrict us, it liberates us, it frees us, it frees us sociologically. Uh, we, can, we can look at, at other people and realize that the only difference between us and an extortioner or a serial killer or a pedophile is that those seeds in our own life that make us capable of doing the exact same things just haven't been watered. It lets us know that nobody is past, uh, past hope that everybody needs to be encouraged. Everybody can be the object of our love because God is trying to work in everybody, wants to work in everybody. So it frees us sociologically that we're all one group. We can function as a group because we're all in the same boat. It also frees us psychologically. And I've already addressed this. We don't need to spin. Uh, We can be authentic. Uh, You know, we don't need to worry about pretense and and hypocrisy there. We can be an open book because we live in the security that as bad as we are and as bad as some of the things we think about and some of the things that we do, our Heavenly Father is absolutely committed to us and he is in the process of perfecting us. And in light of that kind of security that you can't do anything uh, to, to actually eliminate God's love for you, in light of that, if he accepts us, then we can be at home with one another and not have to worry about wearing masks. We can just be ourselves. And in this kind of a group, you know, we can experience the kind of relationships and friendships and love that we really need. You know, the older you get, the more you realize that uh, uh, the most important thing in life, and really the, only, the guiding principle of life, is knowing God and pursuing God. You know, I lived some, in some very formative years um, in the little town of Whittier, uh, in kind of a modest place. You know, our home was pretty modest, and it was kind of a track home there just south of Whittier Boulevard. And, you know, I was in elementary school during that time, and uh, the homes were small, but every home was, just had a boatload of kids. 
and uh, the homes were too small for the kids to stay in, so we were always outside. We didn't have a lot of organized sports in those days other than Little League, and so Sandlot was the name of the game, and the street was our Sandlot. We'd play softball and touch football in the street, and kids running all over the place. And, you know, and uh, that, when the car came by, we just uh, got out of the street, and then we continued to play. And you understand that. That's the way life was back then. You know, I had a dog. And he was out there with us. And every time a car came, that dog would chase that car. <laughs> and if he caught the car, which was rare, uh, he'd just walk away and go lay down again and wait for the next car to come by and then chase it. And I thought, that's the stupidest dog I've ever seen. You know, and I got to thinking about humanity. You know, what we spend our lives chasing often eludes us. And if we do happen to catch it, uh, we realize it doesn't deliver what we hoped that it would. And so we have to ask ourselves, what in the world are we chasing in life? And uh, I think God's advice to us is, hey, hey, why don't you chase the one that left the glory of heaven in order to chase down you? You know, and so, you know, one of the things that... Uh, you know, defines us is that we talk about being a man of God. And really, being a man of God simply means, you know, when you boil it down to just the simplest point, it simply means we chase, we pursue the man of God who came down to give his life for us so that we might live for his glory. Father, thank you for our time here and thank you for the realization that we can live with the truth and uh, that we can be ourselves. We thank you for the uniqueness of uh, each of us in this room. We're all different, come from different walks of life, circumstances of life are different, uh, but there is one huge thing, the main thing that we do have in common and that is that we are blown away by the fact that we are your sons, a part of your family, an heir to your wealth. And somehow in the richness of that spiritual enterprise that you've endowed us with, that uh, we in fact uh, have the resources in your spirit uh, to live for your glory. And we would pray we'd do that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.